I'm back working on the Z80 project. If you've been watching these videos then you'll know that I've got as far as uh, developing the floppy drive interface. I will be showing the schematic for the interface. I won't show it uh, just yet because it will almost certainly change as the project develops. But what I've been working on at the moment is getting to the point where um, I can get a bootloader working so that I can start loading actual programs from floppy disk. So I demonstrated a very basic first uh, stage bootloader in the previous video. Uh, this one contains a second stage bootloader and can actually load some code from the floppy disk. I haven't written the operating system yet. I thought I'd start this video by just briefly showing the software. Now the software will change of course as this develops but I thought I'd show what um, I'm running here at the moment, or at least some of it so that it uh, hopefully is clear as to what's actually going on. So uh, just in brief, the way the software operates, it's fairly um, consistent with this type of machine. And in fact, if you've ever tried reverse engineering firmware from a boot ROM on a vintage computer like this, then it seems like a very convoluted code. Um, but it's actually quite easy to follow once you kind of understand the basics of what's going on because it's fairly consistent throughout um, different types of machine with a given operating system something like CPM generally boots in a very consistent way across different machines so in this particular implementation the way I've written this is we've got the ROM that contains the it contains various bits of code but in particular it contains the monitor that we've seen before and that allows us to perform various tasks on the machine manually and it also contains a bootloader it's a first stage bootloader but it uses a vector stored in RAM so we've got non-volatile RAM now that's why there's a battery attached to the board so we can store various configuration information and that now includes um, the boot up requirement whether it boots direct to the monitor or if it looks for a boot floppy disk and then what it does if it can't find the boot floppy disk but it also contains the um, address or the vector of the default bootloader so there is a simple bootloader built into the ROM but because we're using a vector in RAM that um, vector can be modified uh, on the fly so as soon as it starts loading software then the software itself can change the bootloader to a different one so that's kind of how it works. When we select the B option, or if we let it boot straight through to floppy disk, it invokes the first stage bootloader in the ROM. That causes the system to read the first sector on the first track of the first side of the um, floppy disk. It loads that into um, RAM, and that's the second stage bootloader and of course that is specific to whatever is on the floppy disk you can load whatever bootloader you want now in this case it loads the second stage bootloader that then goes on to load some software from the next few sectors of the floppy disk so I'll demonstrate this in a few minutes but I thought we'd have a quick look at the code first just to try and clarify what's actually going on so we'll go across to the PC so what we're looking at here is the code that's in the uh, boot ROM on the main board. So I won't go through the whole um, ROM. It's mostly the monitor program, um, but you can see in the header part uh, at the top of this, we've got information about the format that I'm currently using for the floppy disk. And uh, I'll scroll down to the uh, bootloader part of this Okay, so as you can see, it's very simple. The ROM loads the vector into RAM at the uh, start each time it boots up. And this does differentiate between warm boot and cold boot. So it doesn't reload everything if you just press the reset button. It does differentiate between power uh, reset and the uh, a reset button reset. So when we invoke the 
uh, bootloader command or if it's invoked by the normal boot up process to automatically boot from a floppy disk it calls this program or this uh, function and all this does is it loads the vector that's stored in RAM and it jumps to that. The, this little construct here, if you're not familiar with this, is just so that um, it can return to the monitor if the code that's ultimately loaded returns. Otherwise the system would uh, most likely crash because um, we'd be overrunning the top of the stack. Now in this case, um, the bootloader vector is actually loaded with the address of this function. And what this does is it um, essentially looks to load the first sector from the floppy disk, which contains our second stage bootloader. So you can see it uh, clears the screen, writes some text. The text just says it's booting from floppy disk. And then it tries to read the boot sector from the floppy disk. And when it does that, once again, we have this construct to allow us to branch to the bootloader that we have just loaded. So I'll now get the code for that second stage bootloader. It's not part of this ROM, uh, of course, because it's on the floppy disk. So I'll just load that file. So this is the code that's currently um, in the second stage bootloader. This is what's loaded or saved onto the first sector of the floppy disk. Uh, when we're compiled of course. So it doesn't do a great deal it, um, and again this is written it's not in a very efficient manner this is for uh, development so it's kind of uh, unraveled code if you like. Um, so it can be made far more efficient than this but what it does is uh, this is uh, once compiled this image is loaded by the first stage bootloader into RAM and it's then given control of the system. And what it does is it clears the video again, uh, switches to bank uh, zero because we run uh, the code from bank zero. If we were loading CPM, for example, we'd want to run it from bank zero because we need access to the bottom of RAM and we can't do that in bank one because that's where the, uh, the ROM resides. Uh, it then puts up a message that says um, operating system test version two. So that will replace the booting from floppy disk text that the first stage bootloader displays. So we should see when we try and boot we should see a message saying booting from floppy disk and that should fairly quickly be replaced by this text when the first sector has been read from the floppy disk. This code then goes on to read in this case just two more sectors. So the code we're going to load is just in two sectors. You normally do a sector count here um, but I'm doing it this way so I can properly debug the uh, code. This code also um, it disengages or it uh, deselects the floppy drive between the two bootloaders. Normally you wouldn't do that, you'll hear the floppy drive clunk twice rather than once. Uh, you wouldn't normally do that but again this is for development and so I can more easily fault find and see what's going on. So it will then load uh, or read the two sectors and copy the contents of those into RAM and when it's finished it will hand control to the code it's just read from floppy disk and uh, that's it. The rest of this is just um, support so it can display stuff on the screen and also so it can drive the floppy disk because of course we no longer have access to the ROM um, once we've loaded this code because that's in a different uh, bank. Okay so uh, and of course we have the read sector um, function as well. So we have everything here we need to actually load the system. Normally it would be the operating system. In this case it's just the uh, game of life game. So we'll go back to the machine. We'll try this out and see if it actually works. So we'll start by putting the floppy disk into the drive. Remember um, the first sector contains our second stage bootloader. That will be called first when we um, invoke the boot uh, loader command. And once that's been loaded into RAM, the system will hand control to it. It will then try to read the next two sectors, load the contents into RAM 
and then try and execute that code. So we'll try and boot up. Got the first message. It's read the first sector. And it's successfully got the code from the disk. So we'll do that one more time. Let's reset the machine. First message, second, and it's loaded the code. So you see it works extremely well. Now at the moment this is using programmed in out. Now to go any further with this development we actually need to take a fairly big step. Uh, we could continue to use programmed in out. It will work fine. If you want to run something like CPM it will work just fine. CPM sits around and waits for sectors to be read anyway so we're not going to have a performance hit by using programmed in out using something like CPM. But if you want to use a multitasking operating system um, then really you'd need something that's a bit more efficient. So ideally we need to implement something like DMA. We can't just make a very simple step now to incorporate that into this design. We've really gone as far as we can with this design without um, adding some fairly comprehensive buffering between the Z80 and the main system. Um, because each time we add something, although there is some buffering, uh, we're still loading up the data and address buses further. And you can only go so far doing that before the system starts misbehaving. So if we want to incorporate DMA or any other additions to this, we need to buffer both the address bus and the data bus. The address bus is fairly straightforward. We just need a couple of um, buffer chips, uh, two 8-bit buffer chips. There is one um, complication to this, especially as we intend to use DMA, in that we'll be using the um, bus mastering feature of the Z80, so we'll be using the bus request bus acknowledge mechanism. Now when we uh, use that, when we issue a, a bus request to the Z80, uh, it hopefully will allow us access uh, or control of the address bus, data bus and a few control lines. And it puts those lines into high impedance mode while we're doing that. Uh, and I'll go into this in more detail in a future video. Um, but the problem here is if we put buffers between the address bus and the system, Although the Z80 will have gone into high impedance mode, the buffers will still be trying to drive the bus, which will cause problems. So we need to um, put those buffers into high impedance mode at the same time the Z80 uh, issues a, a bus acknowledge signal. And of course we can simply use the bus acknowledge signal to control the um, tri-state feature of the buffers. So that's quite straightforward, very easy to do. The data bus is a bit more difficult because Depending on what you're trying to talk to, you'll either be um, writing uh, to the device, but you may also be reading from the device. You need to have a bi-directional buffers. On top of that, you need to determine how you're going to control those buffers because you need to not only control the direction, but you also need to put them into tri-state mode depending on what you're doing for the same reason that you do with the address bus. And um, you can't just use a simple uh, enable bit the way you can with the address bus because you might be addressing different things. You might be reading and writing to ROM or RAM for example or you might be uh, trying to read or write to in-out ports. So the approach I've taken, um, I've already designed this aspect of the system and it will be on the next board. The next board will be quite a lot bigger than this one um, because it will incorporate the floppy drive controller and the buffering. It will not have the DMA straight away, that will be on a future board, but it will be uh, used to develop the DMA. Um, what I've done to uh, develop the system for the next step is to incorporate the address buffers and also to s effectively split the data bus into three. There will be one buffered um, data bus for the ROM, RAM and the video RAM. There'll be another one to control various uh, devices such as the ports, the keyboard, that sort of thing. And then there's another one that's used or will be used for our uh, devices such as the uh, DMA interface, which will essentially be part of the floppy drive interface. 
So I've been developing this already. The um, DMA system has two main parts. The first one is a 16-bit counter that we can load and that keeps track of the address we're trying to read from or write to. And then there is some uh, control electronics which is the bit I'm currently working on. And this is used, it's all three parts, the floppy drive interface, the control and the counter, all work together to give us the interface for our floppy drive system. That's coming along quite nicely and um, I also want to make sure that the way I develop the system we can either use programmed in out or DMA depending on what uh, we want to uh, do with the system. So the reason I'm going through these steps uh, the way I am is this is not a commercial venture this is uh, I'm doing this for fun and these are kind of tests and experiments I've wanted to do for a long time so this gives me the ideal platform to do it and hopefully I can demonstrate to uh, anyone that's interested what I'm doing um, as we progress. So uh, if there's anything in particular you want me to demonstrate then leave a comment but I will be going over uh, this in far more detail as the uh, series develops further. And um, I realize some of you are waiting for the repair videos. I have got some of those underway, so they will be appearing fairly soon. But uh, this project will be going on for quite some time to come. I hope uh, you're still finding it interesting.